Uh, welcome everyone to another episode of Pushing Forward. And uh, we have a, a good friend of ours, a longtime friend, uh, Kevin Ross. And uh, just a little bit about uh, Kevin Ross is I've met him years ago with uh, taking a vehicle CQB instructor course with William Petty at uh, Centrifuge Training. I think it was uh, 2015. It yep. Was 2015. Nasty cold weather out of Dallas Police Range. And uh, saw a guy uh, has been helping helping try out for a very long time. and. Uh, We'll go ahead and uh, go ahead and tell us a little about yourself, Kevin. Um, uh, Kevin Ross, um, I'm a retired police officer now. Um, I started out in the 90s. I'm an old guy, if you can't tell by the color of the beard. <laughs> but um, uh, I started out in the 90s in the Marine Corps. I did five years active duty, about a year and a half in the reserves. Um, after that, I, I wasn't interested in law enforcement. Before I went in, I was kind of a long-haired hippie, was in a rock band, but I went in the military and it squared me away. And went on a ride out with a buddy of mine in League City. He was a SWAT guy. And uh, yeah, I got real interested in the job. And so I started applying around the place, yeah. uh, around the state and around the city of Houston. And ended up getting hired by Texas Highway Patrol. I did four years there with them as a patrolman on the street in the Highway Patrol Division. Um, did mostly DWI and drug enforcement. Uh, I was also on the rescue dive team. Uh, I really liked that. I used to be an underwater welder before I went in the military, so it was good, and a rescue diver, so it was good that they, they actually had that available at the Department of Public Safety. Um, but my last two years as a trooper, uh, I got stationed in Terrell, okay. Texas, and uh, I started looking around at the big city agencies and I wanted to go to a, a real good SWAT team. So I started doing some research on the teams around there. So it pretty much brought it down to Dallas, Irvin, Fort Worth, Arlington, or Garland. Garland was the closest to Terrell. I started applying at places, talked to a few of their officers and got hired by Garland, did 16 years there. And then I retired uh, 15 of it or close to 15. I was on SWAT there. And so now I'm a retired guy, trophy husband, I guess. That's what my <laughs> wife calls me. And so the, all I do now is um, help other gun ranges and places out with uh, training and teaching. Okay, and still teaching with law enforcement departments and? Yes, sir, still teach uh, military LE and a lot of civilians. Awesome, awesome. So as far as uh, when you were, uh, you know, obviously a state trooper, uh, even before, uh, you know, leaving the Marines and then decided to make that jump to law enforcement, uh, so how, what was some of the stuff you kind of did to prepare yourself to, to get into that role? And then when you're doing the job, like as far as, you know, transition for state trooper to SWAT, like what are some of the things you did to prepare yourself? Um, well, luckily the Marine Corps does a real good job of, uh, I wouldn't call it brainwashing, but uh, they do a real <laughs> good job of re-educating you and assimilating uh, you into uh, their mindset and the way of thinking. And it's okay. very direct, disciplined. Um, and I was already pretty much like that. Um, I've got pretty severe OCD when it comes to my gear equipment, the way I run my routines. I don't break them very normally, but going into highway patrol, it was relatively easy because it is a paramilitary academy and very much close to what military lifestyle boot camp or military okay. lifestyle Marine Corps Army or any of the armed forces would be like. Um, <clears throat> to get prepared for it, of course, like the Marine Corps, you got to be mentally fit, physically fit, and I've always been good at staying in that mindset and physically fit as well. Um, Highway Patrol was no different. They were very uh, um, education-oriented academy, extremely heavy on education. We were working 12 to 14 hour days, and there was two a days every day for almost seven months on physical fitness. Uh, when I went to Garland, of course, none of that changed for me through their academy program. And when you change to another department, generally most of the time, even as a lateral, you've got to go through their six-month academy. Yeah. Sometimes it'll be more abbreviated. Um, I didn't do anything different than I had before. I just got mentally prepared for the job that whatever task was given to me or um, test, I was going to succeed. Um, yeah. I always stayed focused and driven on the task at hand and what I needed to do to complete that task mentally, physical fitness, they were gonna make you physically fit whether you mm -hmm. liked it or not, but it was always better to maintain that. And in normal life, like I do now, a lot of people that I've met in the past have, have kind of let themselves go in shape because kind of the switch is turned off now. Yeah. They don't have to do what they used to. I don't believe in that because I believe at any point in time, you might have to get back in service like it or not, yeah. or you might be forced to. Um, and same goes with mental preparedness yeah. for those types of situations as well. Yeah. And I completely agree with that. I mean, like I said, switching off the switch. And uh, 
We leave it off too long, it's hard to turn it back on. Yes, it is. So it's, uh, and you know, living our day-to-day -day lives, it's just something that you have to include into your routine. And and uh, I feel like, you know, I, you know, in the circle group we run with, everybody has that mindset. So it's a, it, it gives an opportunity to kind of everybody to motivate each other. Because I tell you what, you know, if one of us lets go, I share shit. We're gonna be dogging each other, saying, "Man, you're getting fat, dude." So. Oh yeah. Yeah. So yes, I, it is. Um, so, so on that, so being SWAT, uh, you know, sixteen years plus. So what are some of the stuff? It's just like, you know, obviously going through the daily life and you do it for so many years. How do you keep stay focused, not get complacent? Like, what are some of the things you did, like as far as like training frequency? <clears throat> um, training frequency. The great thing about Garland PD, and I love that department. And I, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that any other departments aren't like that. Dallas, Urban, uh, Arlington, yeah. Fort Worth, all of them. Um, what you find when it comes to law enforcement or anybody in general is if um, not everybody is, is tuned into that and believes in that mental um, readiness and physical readiness. So they have to be forced to do it or it has to be part of the job. They have to be paid or scheduled or um, organized to do it. Um, with me, um, and like a lot of things in life, you, will, you, you, you stick out and more opportunities will come your way if you yeah. go the extra mile. When it came to um, Highway Patrol, there wasn't as many opportunities. When I saw them at Garland, uh, I took full advantage of it. Um, I saw many, many opportunities, and not all of them were going to be given to yeah. me, or I couldn't apply for them. So training was pretty much limitless, and the great thing back then was that there was a lot of senior staff that did not take that advantage, yeah. and it was afforded to me. So. I went to every class that was available. I went to every training yeah. class that was available, whether it happened to do with defensive tactics, my job as a patrolman, yeah. or had to do with SWAT or firearms. And so I never got out of that mindset still to this day. And I learned from Dan and many senior guys to me that to become a good instructor, you need to also be a very good student. And uh, with Garland, it was great. Dan wanted to see guys like that, wanted to see them hungry, wanted to see them constantly striving to be better at their job at SWAT and as an instructor. And luckily I was afforded that opportunity and it was encouraged. Now, department didn't always pay for stuff. And yeah. sometimes you had to buy your own gear, your own ammo, yeah. you had to go seek outside training. And if you want to be a better individual, you can't wait for someone to come and do it for you or force you to go do it. You have to seek that, drive to do that, never lose that drive, and continually strive to be better. Yeah, just a pushing forward, man. Yep, that's, that's it. exactly it's, pushing uh, forward. And, and it's good that you, you know, embrace. You still have the mentality because, just like I said, the, you know, the older guys were mentors to you, and then that still you have the opportunity to still train and uh, part of an organization with the Texas Tactical Police Officer Association, which we're going to talk about here shortly. But still being in that role, you still have the opportunity to now become the mentor and uh, just help people throughout their journey uh, as far as up and coming police officers, especially the new, the newer generation of SWAT that uh, roll with the team. And uh, yeah, and you guys are, I'm um, just watching, uh, been out there seeing you guys train. You guys are you know pretty progressive, which is uh, awesome. And uh, you know, Dan, yes, uh, Dan is, uh, he's always out looking to get you guys the best stuff. So which is, which is, uh, yeah, I commend him on that. He is because being proactive in that sense. Let's get into, um, as we call a bad day at office, um, kind of share an experience of like, just like a rough day at work where you've kind of had to overcome and um, just kind of learn from experiences like that and just move forward in what you do. Um, of course, over 20 years on the street, you've got a lot of bad days at the office. Yeah. Um, sometimes it can be something as simple as seeing uh, a horrific incident involving a family, uh, self-inflicted gunshot wound on a child or something like that, that mentally you have to bypass or be able to get over. Um, um, when it comes to being police, um, uh, it's it's not like a lot of other professions. You uh, yeah. you always are gonna see something new and in 20 years, you, you never can have the mindset, I know it all, I've seen it all, I know yeah. how to f fix this. It, because it isn't 20 years in when I retired, there's still stuff you see that you have never seen in the last mm -hmm. 20 years, no matter how busy, how much opportunity yeah. to see it you got, something new always comes. Um, I'd say the worst day that I had, um, and I wouldn't call it the worst, it was, it, it, was it, it had happened every now and then, but one of the worst issues I had was um, we had a domestic incident between um, uh, a husband and wife where he had uh, assaulted her, uh, committed a felony, and it choked her unconscious, and I went there and he had ran off with her yeah their three children and oh, wow. took off, grabbed all of his kids in his arms and took off running. 
And anyway, um, we get there, talk to the wife. She's in an extreme panic. Uh, and uh, of course, she's, she's not concerned about herself. She's concerned about the kids. And she doesn't know what happened to them. And uh, we had had prior history with this guy, so we knew how dangerous this situation could potentially be. We yeah. were extremely busy, so it was me and my partner at the time. And so we decided, hey, it's a large complex. We got to find this guy. You split, go this way. I'll split, go this way. Well, luck of the draw, I found him. And uh, anyway, he wasn't going to make it easy on it, on me. He was calling for backup on his phone as we're going through the car to foot chase, to foot chase, to foot chase. And when I got a hold of the fella, um, I found out I was in a very part of the complex, a very bad part of the complex where there was many, many bad people around and no good guys to help me. And when it comes to cops, that, that's a mindset that I've never let go of. Um, I always used to post on my website some other stuff, the five real rules of the kill house. We used that back in the military and I've used it all my life, but the first two um, ring a true with me and I've always used those as a basis and I always try to yeah. convince new officers is number one, <clears throat> don't expect people to save you. No one's coming. You always have to have that in the back of your mind that you might be alone and have to handle this all by yourself. And number two rule, everything's your responsibility. Yeah. The other three rules apply to other factors, but those first two is the thing that I always remembered when I got in the car and went to work and told myself, nobody's come to save you, Kevin, and everything's gonna be your responsibility how it gets handled when you're there by yourself. And so I ended up in about a three to four minute fight with this guy and ended up tearing my, I uh, torn my rotators four times each in multiple fights over the years, but I completely ripped that shoulder loose and that left, yeah. that right arm was completely useless. So I'm fighting this much larger, much heavier opponent. I finally ended up getting the fight taken care of, but by the time I got the fella into custody, I had completely no use of that right arm and was fighting him one handed. And, uh, <clears throat> Luckily, BJJ helped me out in that in the training because yeah. I had to do a one-arm choke to get him unconscious to just get the cuffs on him. But afterward, I realized uh, at the as the fight was over, I saw people running up because as we were yeah. as I was chasing him, he was calling on the phone talking to somebody. Hey, I need help. Cops are here. They're chasing me through the complex. Get everybody down here now. And I heard that. And I slapped the phone out of his hand as we were running when I tackled him. And when I got to my feet, I was literally surrounded by 30 or 40 people still by myself. Partner hadn't been able to locate me. He yeah. was running code through the apartment and I had to handle and run that situation all to myself. And now I was in a very bad predicament because I was surrounded by potential hostiles and all by myself with a busted right arm. So um, luckily, right after that happened, as I got that guy up and had him pinned and unmoving and handcuffed, I was able to wait just long enough, um, verbal presence and command presence, giving commands to the crowd to stay back off of me and leave me alone. I had to draw my gun out and keep it to my side in my left hand. And yeah. uh, because the right hand, I couldn't lift my arm. And luckily my partner showed up and yeah. quite a few other officers, when they couldn't get me, they put out an assist. And luckily the cavalry came because yeah. if it had gone south past that, I don't know what would have happened to me or anybody else that had been in that altercation. Wow. And those that that mindset, those rules you've learned in the military, just stuck with you, and uh, I mean, mentally prepared you to just not give up. Oh, is, you can't. Yeah. They will. Uh, I can tell you one thing about criminals: they've lived that kind of rough, violent lifestyle. They're very acclimatized to it, and they have no problem using violence as a tool to their advantage. Yeah. And I was like, especially I'll, especially against their loved ones in that incident. You know? Yes, yeah. and with that arm down. He, he, it's kind of like they taught in the military and highway patrol and Garland defense attack is no matter how bad you're hurt, you fight and you keep fighting until you win. If yeah. you if I'd ever gave up in that point, so, even with that arm as busted as it was, I still kept fighting. I had two good legs. I had a good head on, it, on my shoulders and a good left arm. I did not quit until my cover got there. And if they had never arrived, I'd have fought until then. Yeah. And until I couldn't fight any longer, you just cannot give up. Yeah, and you're completely right. I mean, it's just a, it's a mindset that you just need to have, I mean, especially for law enforcement officers being out there because it could change. I mean, that, that whole reaction to where, you know, from what I've told, I mean, from people told me where you have to go hands on, where you have to change your mentality so quickly, it's just, it's tough. I mean, that's a, uh, that's a, uh, 
a, you know, as far as a, a good example of having that proper mindset to keep your body and your mind uh, working together. I mean, just, gosh, having one arm go down, just keeping your mind to whip your other body move, that's, that's pretty, uh, it's pretty intense. It can get pretty, it can get, it can get real bad real quick, and that's one thing in law enforcement, a very calm and stable situation can instantly turn in a matter of seconds or milliseconds into an extreme violent issue or incident, and you, you're expected to be able to flick the switch instantly and be able to try and mitigate that situation yeah. and I was like you've got to be prepared ready see the the signs uh, be focused and be looking for the clues because when it goes yeah. you can't be behind the eight ball on that or be behind the guy that's the attacker you got to be in front of him um, when that arm went down uh, I can tell you I it, it is as strong and as physically fit and mentally capable and prepared as I was for it Trust me, I was worried. I was like, there, anybody tells you they weren't, I was like, I knew I was in a bad spot and I had to just continue doing what I was doing to make yeah. it through it. And <clears throat> that's, uh, that's uh, a lot of people nowadays have become cops. They haven't ever had that experience yeah. or didn't grow up with that. And when they first get into it, a lot of people, if they realize or have that, uh, I don't think I'm gonna win this, they turn that yeah. switch off and I was like, you just can't do that. Yeah, you can't do that. You've got to continue. If you want to survive the incident, you cannot ever give up and you can't yeah. take a break because I can guarantee you 99.9% .9 of the time that other individual is going to take advantage of that situation oh, if yeah. you do. That's and they're it. not going to show you any mercy. No, it's, it's, a, it's a win or lose and you want to win. And that's, that's, that's a, the survival instinct. Um, wow. That's uh, well. I'm glad you pulled out of it. <laughs> yeah, so am I. <laughs> yeah. Um, I spent a year in, yeah. uh, I spent a year off duty for that because yeah. of that injury. It took me well over a year before I could even do one push up. And uh, wow. I was chomping at the bit to get back to back in physical shape. And it, it has adjusted the way I've had to train and be physically fit. But what, uh, Basically, what blocks and stipulations that injury has put on me as far as my physical capability now and uh, and being able to uh, reduced significantly the strength I put into that arm and the yeah. stuff I used to do. As soon as I was able to, I started doing it. Uh, um, had to work basically from zero You're back up again. Up. Wow. It ain't ever going to be right. But. Yeah, it's not going to be, but at the same time, just not being so scared of it, though. That's the thing. I, mean, I know some people, when they suffer injuries, they just. They don't even want to go near it or ever risk it. And but you're in a profession, or when you're in that profession, you had no choice. You had to, you had to be get back in the game. Um, so, wow, wow, that's a that's a good thing. Uh, obviously, you teach that to a lot of other people, uh, a lot of uh, younger officers, and that's that's a good story to to share with them as as a good example. And and it's funny because I've talked to uh, you know other uh, officers mutually that we know, and they're. They're talking about the days before they even had tasers, and he just said that, yeah, there was no tasers. There was no you had to. I mean, sometimes it, it was a fight, and you had to subdue, you know, the the individual, and there was no taser to stop them. So it was it, all yeah. physical. Yeah, yep. that's back a, in the day. Yeah, back in the day. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk about uh, Texas Tactical Police Officer Association (TPOA), and uh, it's an outstanding organization uh, here within the state of Texas, and they provide a uh, they have a, a yearly conference where they provide, they host a lot of different training courses that officers can sign up for, um, mainly geared towards uh, tactical police officer SWAT. And uh, also they do have a yearly competition that they do in the fall. So uh, one, um, one good thing about, I have lots of good things to say about that organization because, you know, as, as uh, being a young entrepreneur, uh, getting out of the military and starting my own company, the you know, you, you're, you're trying to get out there and put your product out there and, you, you know, there's vendor shows you want to go to and a friend of mine recommended it. And I had, you know, a lot of big companies come to it's like Aimpoint, Glock, uh, you know, SIG, a lot of, uh, you know, just high-end uh, companies, they, they sign up and at the, for the vendor show. And so there I was, as it was given the opportunity and, um, you know, my friend introduced some of the people within the organization, like uh, Kevin Ross here. And, yeah, there I was. I had a I had a little banner, little sign. It had like a handful of barrels on the table, and um, the thing about the organization is that they, they just gave me opportunity to get in front of people and, and um, show my products. And as the years went on, I just started going to more shows, and more shows, and and here we are, you know, 2020, and uh, sort of second year being a platinum sponsor, which is uh, 
I mean, I'm, I'm proud to be, you know, associated with that organization. And uh, Kevin Ross has been with it for many years. And we, it's, it's kind of cool because we get together every year, see each other, um, you know, hang out. Uh, and uh, yeah, I got nothing good things to uh, say about it. So, but uh, Kevin, tell you a little bit more. Um, TTPOA is a fabulous organization. There's a lot of state organizations. I teach for them. TNOA, which is Texas Narcotics Officers Association, Arkansas Tactical Officers Association. Um, TTPOA is one of the biggest um, swatter police officer uh, organizations in the U.S. Uh, I'd say we rival NTOA, who is like the standard of what everybody would like to be. And uh, TTPOA's got one of the best vendor shows. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's like Mini Shot Show. I love yeah. it. Ever since I went, I guess it's been 18 years ago, 17, 18. And uh, the first year after the first year, I'd been rolling and training with Dan, and Dan took me under his wing, Dino Colasanto, and uh, I started uh, uh, being his alpha instructor, and then I eventually took over as full. So I've been teaching for TTPOA for about 17 years. Uh, the great thing is about it is, if you're prior military, military, uh, active law enforcement, retired law enforcement, yeah. um, just a patrol guy. You don't have to be a SWAT guy or a TAP guy either. Um, they uh, offer great training in every region throughout the state. You just need to pay attention to it. This was a lot of stuff that I did on my own and paid for it on my own to go yeah. when the departments won't. Uh, one thing that's great about Texas departments is they do have a lot of funding and do send a lot of guys to train yeah. in Arkansas. They don't. A lot of those officers, they're buying, they're taking personal time vacation, paying their own ammo, paying this. And that's what's great about Texas uh, law enforcement um, departments is a lot of them will yeah. pay for this training. But when they didn't or couldn't afford it or we were short-staffed or couldn't, that didn't mean I stopped it. I kept going. Um, they offer phenomenal training. You've got prior law enforcement and military that teach. Uh, current law enforcement, SWAT guys, and they teach everything from indoor classes mm -hmm. to command structure and how to control major incidents, um, explosive breaching, mechanical, shotgun breaching, um, rifle, pistol, shotgun, subgun, every type that you can think of, um, edged weapons. Um, yeah. Got to take a couple of twos classes like that. I love his edged weapons training. Um, when I first started going, the first two classes I ever went to, the first, the first uh, conference I went to, and they're good friends of mine now, good mentors of mine. One of them uses your stuff was Jim yeah. Smith, okay. and former CAG guy, and Paul Howe, Pat Mack, used to teach for TTPOA. I think he still does when he has time, the boy's busy. And, uh, and Jeff Gonzalez. So yeah. my first two guys I ever took training from was former SEAL and a former Delta guy. And I learned a lot during those, and those are the kind of guys that most of us in SWAT want to learn from yeah. uh, and, and, and be taught and trained by, because those guys go out, they've developed and used these tactics for years and use them overseas and find out which ones are the most effective and their tactics evolve yeah. constantly. So their training involves constantly. Yeah. They're always having to change and be ahead of the bad guys. Mm -hmm. And so not every tactic or, or, or thing that they teach us can be applied to law enforcement because yeah. we have a different set of rules than they do. Yeah. And, um, but it's funny now how similar the bad guy can be. They're in and amongst the normal population. You usually can't identify them until it's kicking off. And yeah. so that's the thing that they're running to overseas. And so, um, it's great. Um, the conference is phenomenal. Two days of vendor show, like yeah. you said, and I mean, you get to see the best gear, the best guns, the best yeah. weapons, optics, you name it. Um, nowadays, uh, and we do it pretty much regularly now, is the open shoot that yeah, uh, they the range have. Day, yes. The yeah. range day that is prior yeah. to vendor shoot day. I always love going to the range day, either assist it. Half the time they ask me or another guy to run it or help run it, so we kind of yeah. we kind of get to pre see them, but the, yeah. the attendees really get to go out there and yeah. try out all the new products and new weapons, yeah. optics, everything, and that is something that a lot of the uh, tactical trade shows yeah. in the U.S. don't do. Yeah, I know yeah. NTOA does it, TTPOA does it, and uh, I love getting to do that because 
in the vendor show, you're going to see something nice and cool yeah. and everything, and you're like, man, I wish I could shoot that. And well, now, for the last few years, and we've done it for quite a while, you can. You just show up to the open shoot the day before, and uh, yeah. that the vendor show starts, and you get to go out there and shoot everything. Springfield brings all of their yeah. guns. Triarc brings yeah. all of their guns. Um, Aim Point's bringing your guns and many other guns and yeah. attaching their optics to it. So you want to check out the high-speed new Triarc rifle with an EOTech <laughs> or an Aim Point on it, it's yeah. going to be there. So. Yeah, and that's one thing too. And, and, and yeah, the officer can just show up. Don't don't bring any ammo. Don't bring anything. Like we, yeah. all the vendors provide that stuff. And and so you know, it, and for people watching it and who are um, you know within the industry or have companies and stuff like that, it's a good organization to look into. And then you can reach out to the website and, and become a vendor. And I highly recommend it. You know, whether you're manufacturing firearms, you're manufacturing any type of kit, uh, gear, uh, flashlights, anything that could be. Uh, in that kind of realm of uh, you know duty tactical um, or you know just firearms, yeah, I highly recommend signing up for that conference and uh, you know come hang out with everybody. And that's the cool thing about it. I just like it's just been uh, fun over the years hanging out with everybody and seeing everybody uh, you know all the time, and uh, it's good stuff. So oh yeah, it's it's like old home week. You yeah. know, for the guys like you and my buddies from Main Point and stuff yeah. that are busy, we don't get to see each other, yeah. hang out, and have a beer. Um, we get to see each other vendor days, the two vendor day shows, and I'm usually one of the yeah. coordinators or one of the check-in guys for the vendors, helping those guys out, and then the open shoot days, and then yeah. uh, <clears throat> that, that's the great thing. That's, that's one of the best things about TTPOA and the conference and the SWAT competition is if it wasn't for the vendors, we couldn't have what we have, man, and it's great. We've got one of the best shows, thanks to the TTPOA staff and the vendors that have stepped up and come up their platinum yeah. vendors like Triarch, my buddies at First Beer. Yeah. Um, uh, that that's what really makes the show, and uh, that's what uh, everybody gets to go out and see all that stuff in between taking the classes uh, on Thursday and Friday, and then they get to do the operators courses yeah. uh, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Okay. So, what are some recommendations for? anybody as far as uh, new police officers some advice you can give them or somebody who's transitioned out of the military want, wants to become a police officer any advice you want to just give them or uh, some of your experiences or anything else about yeah um transition from the military depending on what your mos specialty was when you're in the military isn't going to be too much different um depending on whether it's a city state or county organization mm -hmm. that you or department that you go to um it's going to be relatively simple you do have to switch gears a little bit especially with city organizations and county like with state police i know my buddy from new mexico and i being from texas dps it's more militarized and easier to get into uh, get into working into that organization because it's almost just like being in the military. Same rank structures and everything: corporal, sergeants, lieutenants, captains, majors, light colonels, colonels. And but when it comes to civilian law enforcement, it's slightly different. But it's nothing yeah. that a military member couldn't adjust to. Um, being prepared for it, if you're going to be a, a cop, and uh, I suggest that. You really research the departments you're going to to see if it's going to be a good fit. Um, one thing that I'm not going to say that they're not looked down upon, but it's going to affect your uh, your um, ranking in the department. It can affect your retirement and having multiple retirements and stuff like that is what we call cop gypsies. They like to work two or three years here, jump to another department, work two or three years. What what they looked into didn't want that one either, jumped into yeah. another one. Um, <clears throat> And uh, so you don't want to make a career out of that. I always tell new guys, you know, usually I'll tell them first thing is start researching the departments. Research long term what you're going to see for your retirement and your pensions, the availability and longevity of the department, the training you can do in the department, the lateral moving inside the department. Is it very small and lateral movement is almost um, non-existent because when they get in that position, that guy's going to stay there till he retires or yeah. dies and uh, be so that you don't basically hamstring yourself going in there and you think you're gonna start out being a patrolman for four or five years and then go detective, go SWAT and all this stuff. There might not be that free of lateral movement into those other occupations within the police department. Um, one thing I'll tell you going into police work is just like the military, certain units of the military, you need to be very mentally prepared, um, ready to work, uh, be very attentive to everything that goes on, pay attention, take notes, take two times, three times the amount of notes you'd normally take on something, ask, 
uh, advice from senior officers. Pay attention to your senior officers and maintain physical fitness. Yeah. Um, nowadays, I see a lot of people that let the physical fitness go, and I know a lot of departments have relaxed standards on that, and it is because yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like I'm worried about the military right now. Uh, can the kids today, a lot of them that I've seen, um, can they even complete the basic physical standards to make it in the military and maintain that physical standard while they're in the military? And uh, I was like, you can't ever get complacent and be, hey, I'm good with 70% or I'm good with 80. You've always got to strive to be the best you can be and always strive to be better than you were the day before. Yeah. Physical is not easy. That's, no, that's no, point. it's not. Um, <laughs> you, 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 it's the whole point of it. You have to, you have to do it. In policing, it's like in the military. You cannot rely on you yourself, no matter how many years of experience or what you've done in the past, affect your decision making. If you don't know, you don't know. If you've got a question, ask somebody. Yeah. Um, I tell people that want to be a cop, I say, don't go to a little town that doesn't do much unless that's what you want to do as policing. If you want to be a police officer in a large metroplex or city that has a very large population, go request and sign up for a ride out and make sure it's a ride out on a Friday or Saturday night and a deep night's yeah. one. You're probably going to see just about everything you can see in one or two rides and that'll tell you whether or not you think you're going to be able to uh, be interested in that job or whether that might be uh, not the career I want and I need gotcha. to take another path. All right, uh, last question is what is pushing forward to you? It's just uh, something that it's, it's, just, it's just what we live by. It's that mindset that we live by at Triarch and I know a lot of us and other like-minded individuals associated with the company, we just adopted that mentality and uh, you know for us it's, it's a little bit different for everybody but what's it mean to you? Pushing forward it's basically the same you know, it's the same thing I do in life and have done every day, and I recommend most people that uh, have that mindset mentality. It's harder to find nowadays. Pushing forward to me means always striving to be better than you were a second before, a minute before, the day before. Um, you want to be better, more mentally prepared, physically prepared. Um, you want to always be evaluating and um, and testing yourself, especially when it comes to firearms or a tactical yeah. environment. You can't ever get complacent. Um, uh, one of my old Delta buddies, uh, Paul Howe, he used to say, life or SWAT is, um, uh, is um, whenever they, they uh, put guys through the uh, program, um, it's, it's a constant evolving evolution that never stops, selection. And he, he used to say, Selection is a never-ending process in every form of life, and I have took on that and thought of that for the last sh shit, 15 to 20 years, and he's right. It doesn't matter what you do, what your job is. Selection is a never-ending process. You can never stop. You can never become stagnant. You've always got to be better than you were. I don't care if you're a CEO of a company, you own your own business, you're a police officer on the street or in the military. It is individually up to you to make sure that you are better than you were yesterday, better than you were last year, better and next the next day or the next year, you'll be 10 times better than you are today. Yeah. And the only way you can do that is constantly pushing forward, gaining more knowledge, having a better open mind to other things that are coming down the way. If there's a better way you need to be doing it when it comes to physical preparedness, Physical preparedness goes along with mental preparedness, in my yeah. opinion. I go, you can be the baddest ass, most physically fit, CrossFit competitor, but if you got a weak mind, when the body starts hurting, you'll quit. Yeah. I was like, you can't ever. Everything's got to be better than it was, and you've always got to be striving to be more mentally and physically prepared for anything that can come up. Nowadays, in the world we live in, I go, just going to the store nowadays, can you can be in trouble in a matter of milliseconds. Yeah. It doesn't just affect military and law enforcement, it'll affect you as a civilian. Yeah, and you could be there with your family too. Yep, you, I was yeah. like, you've constantly got to strive to be better than you were the day before, be pay, paying attention to more things, learn more knowledge, be better prepared and better fit, and never ever think that you're at the point that you don't have to go forward. There's always a reason to step over that line and continue in that direction. And that's what I believe pushing forward is. I like never that. staying static, always being dynamic and moving forward. I like that. Never think that you can't step across that line. Yeah, I like that a lot. So I appreciate it.
It's an awesome doubt. interview. Always good hanging out with you. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, it's been a minute. So, well, I'm looking forward to, um, well, let's talk some gear and uh, hit the range and have a good time. Okay. All right. Thanks for tuning in.